All right, we are back. Welcome to the start and the end of week four here on Wednesday. So it turns out that computers are not yet smarter than humans. Uh, I thought I'd update you on that Turing test uh, dated Monday, 11:28 a.m. Of the five computer finalists in this year's uh, Turing test prize, at least three managed to fool humans into thinking they were human conversationalists, ready to speak about subjects ranging from M&M to Slaughterhouse Five and everything in between. These machines are showing that we're merely a clock cycle away from true AI. This fellow notes, I was fooled. I mistook Eugene for a real human being. In fact, and perhaps this is even worse, he was so convincing that I assumed that the human being with whom I was simultaneously conversing was a computer. Among the, uh, um, another of the entrants, Jabberwocky, can apparently even woo the ladies. Some of its conversational partners confide in it every day. One conversation with a teenage girl lasted 11 hours. Uh, <laughs> The winning submission this year, Elbot, fooled 25% of judges into thinking he was human, but the threshold for the 1K, 100K prize was 30%, maybe next year. So that close. Um, so you should have in your hands uh, one of our 339 games of 15, these little plastic toys. If not, just duck on out if you'd like one from one of the course's teaching fellows. You've all probably put at least a modicum of thought into the color you want, so you're going to get to keep that color. But go ahead and do this. Take out from your game of 15 that little circle, which is in the bottom right corner. That's just a placeholder for shipping. And that should leave you with a hole in the game. Uh, please pass it to the person next to you. Introduce yourself if you don't know them. And then in return, take that person, scramble it up for a few seconds, and then hand it back. So this is perhaps uh, what not to do, teaching 101, right? Give everyone something else to do during class and then tell them to do it. But uh, your goal for, let's say, the next, uh, until Monday, it's, even though that's pretty generous, is come back with that puzzle solved, if you actually remember to. Uh, brownie points, perhaps, if you zone out for the entirety of this lecture and have it done by the end of 90 minutes, uh, depending on how good the person next to you was. Um, so for those of you playing along at home, uh, you can get these at Party City. In fact, I need to do a little shout out here on camera to Mrs. Malin, my mom, uh, who went to three Party Cities in Connecticut, of all places, this past week to get, us the, get these for us, since I couldn't really find them locally, and then she overnighted them to us. So thank you, Mrs. Malin. If we could. <laughs> All right. So um, in other news, you'll recall from Problem Set Zero, we challenged you as a uh, procrastinatory extra credit question to make a lolcat of some sort. Well, one of our own teaching fellows, Aaron, kind of took that to heart and ran with it, as well as one of the other TFs and made some lol jansus. Uh, if you've checked out Facebook recently, it's by invitation only, but there's a CS50 staff uh, Facebook group, and among the recent photos posted were these. If we could dim the lights just a little bit. <laughs> so that there, of course, in the back is Jansu, our, our head teaching fellow. I do have her permission to reveal these today. Here's another one. <laughs> Jansu there on the left. And number three. Number four. Aww. Number five. <laughs> and finally, in testament to exactly just how much free time uh, our teaching fellows apparently have thus far, my favorite. 
Jensu, of course, being from Turkey. So perhaps uh, you can access those somewhere online at some point. So um, another thank you, not so much to my mother this time, but to Amazon. So starting with this uh, upcoming problem set to be released on Friday, we'll actually be putting both the standard edition students and the hacker edition students on cloud.cs50.net, formerly known as Hacker2 and Hacker3. So you will begin to move away from nice.fas to an environment that's similar in spirit, but entirely within our own control. And so if we depict here little old Harvard Hall at top right, you on your laptop, uh, you will be SSHing not to nice.fas anymore, but instead from your own laptop here through the intertubes, as we say here, through our Amazon firewall, eventually hitting this central virtual machine here. And then as promised in previous weeks, you'll be randomly or somewhat intelligently assigned to one of the back-end virtual machines. And you'll have shared storage space there. And for those of you continuing to bite off the hacker editions, we'll have some even more fun, juicy stuff to come in the weeks to come. Um, so our thanks to Amazon let me say, for providing us with credit with which to use their EC2 service. Um, they are providing us uh, with full reign over the service without having to even pay that uh, 10 cents per hour fee. Uh, from the sound of the clicking, I can tell that you're taking to heart this Game of 15 puzzle. Well, I'm just going to keep lecturing today. Um, so tune in and tune out as you see fit. So thanks to Microsoft as well. So in addition to um, what's depicted here, as we'll discuss in a second, you'll notice that under the course website software link, we added a new area, the MSDN Academic Alliance, because SEAS and the college have opted in to uh, Microsoft Software Center. And so you as students in this course, and more generally at Harvard, uh, have access to all of the software, Microsoft software, listed now in this drop down. So if you've ever been curious to play with Access or your own Exchange server, MapPoint, uh, very Office Groove, Office Project, OneNote, uh, SharePoint, SQL Server, Visual Studio, Visual PC, Visual C++, uh, Vista, XP. Uh, in various editions, you can now um, download all of this if you would like uh, throughout your time here at Harvard. Simply follow directions on the website. You'll need to request a username and passwords of the course's sysadmins. We'll set you up with that account on Microsoft's website. But uh, if you've been meaning to try out, say, Vista or go back to XP on your laptops, um, feel free to check out the downloads there. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Can you download Windows and use it on a Mac using Boot Camp? I suspect as much. I should probably say you should read the fine print when downloading the software, but in theory that, that should work. Good question. Other questions? Well, the teaching fellows, um, let me preface this, we don't have one of these for everyone, um, but the teaching fellows were quite excited to receive, um, thanks to our friends at Microsoft, not only access to that software, but the TFs last night were surprised with their own copies of Office Professional, and for the first time, um, a little something more. So it has been one of my goals since last fall to optimize the grading process in this course. You may think it takes you guys a long time to do the problem sets. It takes us a ridiculous amount of time to grade the problem sets. And what we've hoped to do is eliminate as much of the tedium of that process of pointing and clicking and alt-tabbing as much as is possible so that the teaching fellows can use grading really as an extension of their classroom and an extension of the teaching process. So it's not so much about adding points and deducting points, but providing you guys with feedback. And so toward that end, um, Cato has done a wonderful job of generating, as some of you have already seen, PDFs that are automatically generated of your uh, C source code that's nicely syntax highlighted with colors. It's printed in landscape mode, so we have lots of room for comments. And then you'll soon be able to download these PDFs and our comments on them via the course's website. But in order to optimize the process by which the TFs either type comments on your source code or highlight lines of interest, cross out lines of interest, um, even scribble on the screen or record notes, um, the TFs were quite surprised to be given, thanks to Microsoft last night, um, their very own tablet PCs, which we will be using um, throughout the duration of the semester on an experimental basis to um, improve the flow of grading. Um, so these are Dell's Latitude XTs. Let me uh, have our floor model come up for just a moment. <laughs> Ken? <laughs> So this is as much of an experiment as, uh, for us as anything, uh, but we thought we would at least tout the specs that the, the elite on campus will now be touting. So Ken here is holding a 1.2 gigahertz low voltage dual core uh, Dell Latitude XT 
uh, tablet PC with two megabytes of L2 cache, three gigabytes of RAM, 120 gigabyte hard drive, LED uh, backlighting for its LCD, and the ability not only to use its pen, but also his finger to point and click and move things around. And so if you saw me scribbling a moment ago, uh, I too got a toy. So uh, for lectures and section should these prove useful as well as for the grading process. So if you see some cool kid on campus pulling out a tablet, odds are they're one of the courses teaching fellows like Ken here. So with those thanks behind us, let's dive back into computer science 50. So this week gets even more fun, I think, because for the first several weeks of the class, we need to focus on syntax and on some basics. What does it mean to write source code? What does it mean to compile code? What does it mean to be debug? But now, assuming that some of these first problem sets have kind of raised your comfort level and your savvy with some of the basics, just writing simple, straightforward programs, now can we begin to introduce some more sophisticated features of computers in general and C specifically. And with these features, for instance, can we come back to this problem? So you may recall from a previous uh, example, we tried to write a function that simply swapped the values into variables. Now, sort of a simple idea, but it's kind of compelling because as soon as we got to sorting and searching last week, this very basic idea of being able to exchange two values from left to right toward an end of sorting, all of a sudden does even this simple function become, oh, useful for more than just toy demo. But this function here, this implementation of swap in order to swap two integers just didn't work. So why does this implementation of swap just not work if called with two integers, A and B? Think back a couple lectures ago. Yeah. So that's one interesting point. So it doesn't return any values. Notice that, and I gotta get used to using my own toy here, notice that it returns void, aka nothing. The implication of that is that the function might do something, but it can only have side effects, like printf, whereby it does something, but it doesn't return anything to the caller. So if we're not even returning maybe one of the swapped values, this one seemed to have all that much use. Can, yep. So that too. So these variables, for instance, temp here is clearly inside of the swap function. And so we learned um, a couple of weeks ago that when you have variables like this, aka local variables, they only exist. They're only scoped between the most recent set of curly braces, which means temp after this function is called disappears. Even A and B, even though these things are generally called arguments or parameters, they're technically local variables. Because you might recall that picture from a couple of weeks ago or a couple of lectures ago when we had this thing here. Well, in addition to foo and main getting their own stack frames with local variables, well, similarly, do we consider the parameters passed into main, argv and argc, and any parameters passed into some general function foo to be local variables in the sense that they are put on the stack? Well, so here too, a, b, and temp are really just local variables. So as soon as this function returns, any changes you've made to it, just disappear. And that's fundamentally because when you call a function like swap, if it's defined like this, here in this same file here, well, notice that, uh, whoops, this is the correct version. Oh, buggy, buggy three. Notice here that in buggy three, we have this implementation of swap. Notice that it's invoked. If I scroll up here to the main function, and the main function recalls just doing some silliness. So it's initializing x to 1, y to 2, not all that interesting. It's telling us what those values are here. It's then claiming that it's swapping them because in this line of code here, we're actually calling swap. But we're passing in x and y's bits, but not those actual bits, but copies thereof. So it's quite true that the numbers 1 and 2 get passed in for A and B down here, but those are their own copies, their own 32 bits for A, their own 32 bits for B. And this function then arguably works. By this point in the story, B and A's values have been exchanged, but the moment this function exit or returns, returns void, what happens to A and B, to be clear? So that's it. They disappear. The stack frame is removed effectively, and that memory can be reused for some other function. So this would seem to limit the utility of what we can actually do in writing functions. And yet the whole point of introducing functions initially was to simplify our code and to allow us to factor out sort of conceptually 
uh, related lines of code, well, if you can't really do as much in a function as you can in main itself, that would seem to call into question their their value. Well, so here's the thing. In addition to pass by value, which we just saw, and that's the idea of making a copy, you can also pass variables around and more interesting data structures, as we'll eventually see, by what's called reference or by pointer. And in this manner, do you not pass in copies of the variables themselves, but you instead tell the function where to find the original values in memory? So what do I mean by that? Well, here too, we can truly take this thing out for a spin today. So if we have our RAM laid out just as a rectangle here, then this is some number of gigabytes. Let's just arbitrarily divide this thing up for now into bytes. And just because we need some way of talking about these individual bytes or addressing them, we'll call this one, two, three, four, five. And it appears the tablet only magnifies the poor quality of my handwriting. Look like a child, my God. All right. <laughs> so be it. So now we have a chunk of, that is my RAM. So that is the three gigabytes of RAM in the TF's laptops, not drawn to scale. And this is the first byte, the second one, the third. I'm mean, intentionally not starting at zero today, just so we don't run into an annoying sort of nuisance. So if I do something like this, so int uh, x, int x gets, let's say, the number seven, semicolon. Well, that puts the number seven somewhere in memory. Let's assume that it, it's the very first thing my program's done, and so it ends at location one in RAM. Well, when I print out X, we're just telling, say, printf, go print the value in X. And so what really happens is somewhere in memory, the computer rem remembers that, you know what, this location here, numbered one, is also known as symbolically X. So the computer, the program, some kind of, has some kind of symbol table, like an Excel spreadsheet with two columns that has variable names, and then locations somewhere uh, in the computer's RAM so that printf and other functions know how to get at them. But we said this is a problem because if we call a function like swap and pass in a number like seven and eight, if we have also int, whoops, int y gets eight, well, this now is going to pass into that function its own copy of seven and its own copy of eight. And so what that means is if all of a sudden in memory, if this is x and this is y and we call that function swap, just to be consistent with the names, what were the two parameters called to main? So a and b. So what's really happening is copies of x and y are being passed to swap a.k.a. A, a and B. And so what you have for a moment in time is duplicate values inside the computer's RAM. And yes, you do go about swapping 7 and 8 at some point. And so 7 goes here, 8 goes here. But then as soon as that function returns, all of this memory is reusable. Some other functions can take advantage of it. And so the original values x and y don't get changed. But we seem to have an opportunity here. If we care about swapping the original values, rather than tell the swap function what those values are, why don't we just tell the swap function where those values are? And the notion of uh, doing that, telling a function where something is, is to pass in that variable, not by its value, but by its address in memory, by reference, by pointer. These descriptions are all pretty much synonymous. So if we want to do that in a function form, we can do this. So I've rewritten the swap function to say, you know what, swap does no, lo no longer takes an int and uh, a and an int b, it takes rather a pointer to an int and a pointer to an int called a and b. And by this we mean the two parameters passed to the swap function are now going to tell swap where x and y are, not what x and y are. So what does this mean for us? Well, this means when we actually call this program, we're going to run the pro we're going to implement the function a little differently. So this is now swap.c. It's almost identical to buggy3.c except for one line that's on the screen here. What one line has changed apparently? Yeah, so the actual call to swap itself, notice here, so notice that I've slightly changed the syntax. What's been added there? So these ampersands, which we've not used as a piece of syntax before. So it turns out that if you want to tell a function what the address of some variable is, where it is, you simply give it its name, but then put an ampersand in front of it. And what that does is it's the address of operator. It's going to pass into the swap function, not the value in x, but its location in memory. So what do I mean by that? Well, if we go back to our story a moment ago, 
and whereby we had this chunk of RAM and we divided it up into, woo, and we divided up into squares representing individual bytes. We said this was location one, this is location two, this is location three, this is four, and so on. We have for the moment in the story the values uh, seven and eight inside of memory there. What we really want to pass to the swap function isn't x, isn't x, still getting used to this, comma y, but we want to pass in instead ampersand x ampersand y and what that's going to do is whereas in this case it would end up passing in the values 7 and 8, take a guess as to what this means gets passed to swap. Yeah, literally 1 and 2. Now we're kind of oversimplifying because in a computer with like 3 gigs of RAM the numbers are much bigger than 1, 2, 3, 4 but the idea is the same. So when you pass something by reference or pass it by pointer you're simply looking up in RAM the literal address of that variable, 1, 2, 3 or 1023 if it's farther along in RAM and telling the function that that's its address in memory. And now you've kind of circumvented this issue of not having access to the original bits. Because if you're telling the swap function where to find this thing in memory, well that means that he can now just go to that value in memory himself. And this is one of the features in C that does not exist by design in more recent languages like say Java or PHP. You're, you're hit, the, these kinds of low level details are hidden from you for better or for worse. The worse in the sense that um, you no longer have as much control with the language of, like Java over where stuff is in memory. But what's the upside of newer languages hiding these kinds of lower details that we're nonetheless focusing on today? It's security, right? You seem to now, we're, it, the implication of this seems to be that uh, the swap function in being told where something is in memory, he can now go to that location in memory. But a logical extension of that is if he can go to that address in memory and that address is just a number, why can't the swap function just go to any number, any address in memory? And that's precisely the weakness in C and C++ that adversaries, hackers, try to take advantage of. Well, let's see how we can actually use it for good here. So one thing we've changed is the function's declaration, its signature. Notice that, no that notice that the first parameter in is not just int a but it's int star a and you just have to remember that when you're declaring the function you use stars to indicate that this isn't a primitive like an int, it's a pointer to a primitive and here we've added the asterisk before b to indicate the same thing. Now notice we're still declaring a variable called temp, we're still assigning temp some value but what's different here versus our previous line? So in the original buggy version I'm just saying temp gets A and the goal of that was just to keep a copy of A around so that we don't clobber it and lose track of it. But the syntax here is slightly different. So take a guess now in this context here with this first line of real code, why, what is that line saying exactly? Int gets star A. What's that? What store at the location in A, the location A. So by adding the star before the variable's name here, you're telling C, treat the following variable, A, not as a literal value, but as an address of something else. Not quite sure what's there, but go there, star A, grab that value and put that value in the variable temp. If by contrast I'd goofed and kind of forgotten the meaning and I just did this, in English, what would I have just stored in temp if I left the line like that? temp gets A. So I'd, act, I'd be putting the address of A in temp but this would actually now be a, a, a bug in the program. The compiler would yell at me because now this is when I'm trying to, it looks like, assign a pointer to an int to what kind of data, what kind of variable? An int. So you kind of have a type mismatch. In fact, let's see what happens if I compile this thing now. So make swap, even though we've not compiled it before. If you start to get warnings like this, assignment makes integer from pointer without a cast. Well, that's kind of a cryptic way of saying you're trying to assign one variable type to another and you're not explicitly using casting to sort of proactively tell the compiler, I'm not an idiot, I mean to do this. Whereas in this case, it's sort of ambiguous. Was this a mistake or was this intentional? So if I really wanted to be specific and I said, deal with it. Make this be considered an int. Well, this would actually still be a bug because this is probably bad, forcibly converting an address to a number, but it would now compile without that warning because you're at least taking control of the situation. But back to the story at hand. So this is the correct code. I'm now storing the value 
in the address called A in temp. Now, what's the, what are the next two lines probably doing? So A and B are pointers again. So what does star A mean, if you had to summarize it in English? The left-hand side of that expression, star A. So go to the, go to the location A. So dereference the pointer called A. Go there, and what do I want to put there? Whatever's in B. So if we wanted to sort of represent this, what A and B now really look like is we clearly have some piece of memory, say 7, and some piece of memory inside of which is 8, but we've now declared these pointers, which we'll generally draw similarly as a rectangle, called A, and another one called B. And what you'll see in books and in sections and even in lectures, when we talk about pointers, we could be really anal and say, you know what, what's really an A is the number one, the address of where the value 7 was, if we think back to the RAM example a moment ago. And what was really in B? Two. So that's technically what's going on, but it's a lot easier to think of this instead as like an abstract notion. A pointer is something that looks like this or something that is this conceptually. So if you have some variable of pointer A, just draw it pictorially with an arrow like that, which hopefully makes more clear now what's happening in the code. So when I have an arrow pointing from A to 7 and an arrow pointing from B to 8, that's just like saying star A. Star means go follow the arrow and whatever's there, clobber it with the process of following the other pointer B, follow its arrow, grab its value 8, and put it there. And so the effect of that is in fact to swap. And then finally this last line, why do I not have a star before temp? Well temp is just a variable. So temp is just a variable. So to fit it into this picture here, if this again is A and this again is our pointer B and this is actually the chunk of memory that stores the values 7 and 8, aka location 1, aka location 2, which is equivalent to saying that stored in A is the value 1, stored in B is the value 2. Well what is temp? Well temp kind of fits into this picture conceptually down here, calling it temp. And so at some point we put the value 7 in there, we clobber 7 and put 8 here, and then what does this last line of code do? It clobbers B with the value in temp. So that's all. So it's funny because even one of the TFs and I were sort of reminiscing outside of class a moment ago that pointers tend to be one of the hardest things for students new to this stuff to wrap their minds around. I mean, in fact, I even admitted that it was in the back right hand corner of Elliott House's dining hall that I finally understood some years ago what a pointer was. But that's all it is. It's just the address of something in memory. And thus far, we've sort of been revealing to you all this while that RAM is, you know, addressable. The first byte, second byte, all the way up to the three billionth byte for three gigs of RAM. Well, pointers just relate to where things are in memory. And as soon as you have the ability as a programmer to go to specific locations in memory, can you start to do a lot more powerful things like swapping values correctly, but also some more dangerous things. And so again, that speaks to some of the compromises of like the iPhone and the jailbreaking last year. So just to summarize syntax here, um, pointers are declared. That is, you say, give me a pointer called P by saying the type of the variable that it's supposed to point to, prefix the name of the pointer with a star, and that's it. So in this example here, whereas i and j are just some typical ints would be declared as you're used to, if you want to declare a pointer to an int called p, it's an int star p. And by convention, do most people put the star right before the p? You'll sometimes see a space, so someone might say int here star just to make the distinction clear. It doesn't really matter, but I would say this is the most common approach to prefix it right next to the variable. So don't be, uh, beware in case you see it other ways. So what does this really mean um, in terms of useful code? Well, oh, and this picture here, this is taken from one of the recommended resources. So when you declare an int i and an int j, it's like getting two chunks of memory, two squares in memory, 32 bits each, called i and j. And why are the question marks there by default, apparently? you don't know what's there, right? We saw some interesting quirkiness last week when I just started printing out the, the values of random variables before we'd actually done anything with them and we saw huge numbers, even negative numbers. Well, that's just because question mark, who knows what's there? Because if your program's been running for some time and the stack has been growing and shrinking, well, there just could be some leftover bits from previous stuff. Well, now, using that same picture, if I say P gets ampersand I, conceptually, what does that mean? What am I storing in P? 
So the address of i, and so this is neat here because you, the programmer, don't have to know in advance where i is. You can figure out where i is just by using ampersand i. Because again, you don't have control over where things precisely are ending up in memory generally, at least with respect to the stack. So you kind of need to ask the operating system, hey, by the way, where did you put this variable? You need to ask c, where did you put it? And you can do that by way of ampersand i. So the effect of that line of code is to do something like like this. So if our pointer is just arbitrarily represented as a circle, and again the variables i and j are just those square boxes, in them right now we don't know what's there. But if we say p gets ampersand i, it's like drawing an arrow from p and pointing it to that box called i. And the reason that this tutorial here has now said, you know what, you can call this box either i or star p. Well, that's just because, again, the star operator says go to this address. And where is that address? Well, it's this box right here. Well, let's do something with this. The next interesting line of code we can add is this. So star p gets 5. In English, how would you explain this line of code? What does that say? OK, so the value at p should become 5. And that's not quite precise. So it's the value at the address p should become 5 or go to the location described by p and put the value 5 there. So take p, follow the arrow that leads you to a square box in this case, plant the number 5 right there. So you can define it any number of ways but just keep distinct what we mean by address and what we mean by the actual value. All right, well it turns out that we've been using pointers for quite some time and you've seen stars, asterisks in your code before but for the most part we've been saying yeah, we'll get back to that. Well, where in fact have you always been typing one of these star symbols? So in main, right, it's int, main, int, arg, c, char, star, arg, v, brackets. And we just kind of waved our hands at that. Last week we did reveal that arg, v is just an array of strings, but yet we didn't have you type string there. So it looks like, it sounds like arg, v was an array of, of char stars. Well, what does that mean? Well, it was a string conceptually. Today it sounds like arg, v is an array of pointers to chars, which is kind of interesting. So what is this getting at? Well, it turns out that an array is, can be thought of really as a pointer. So remember array, an array is a chunk of memory and when you ask the, com um, when you ask the computer to give you an array, you really just get back, you do get back the, as much memory as you asked for and you can describe it by way of its name, in this case A. But what you're really being given is the address of the first chunk of memory. So when you declare in an array like A5, what that's doing for you in memory is it's returning to you for your control 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So what it's really returning when you say something like int A bracket 5, when you say something like this, that's really calling this array A, but all that's stored in A really is the address of the very first byte of memory. So if again I assume that just for simplicity my array was the very first thing this computer had to deal with and so it ended up at the very start of my RAM, hence location 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, using one indexing today just for simplicity. Well, what's really an A? Well, A defined here is itself just a box of memory. It's 32 bits. All pointers, at least in this context, are 32 bits, just like an int. So A is itself a variable, even though it's an array variable, but what do you think is stored inside of A based on this hint here? What is A literally? It's just the value 1. And so I really shouldn't put A right at the beginning there. I should really say that A is a pointer somewhere and it happens to point to this first chunk of memory. So when you declare an array, call it A, what you're really declaring is a pointer that is the address of some chunk of memory that happens to be of length 5 in this case. And this now kind of hints at why you, the programmer, have to remember how big your array is. Because if an array is really just implemented with 32 bits that happen to store the address of the first byte of that array, there is no inherent recollection of what the last byte in that array was. Right? There's no sort of special metadata here. There's no little fine print that says, oh, this goes from location 1 through 5. An array is defined only by its first location. And the onus is on you to remember just how big that array was. 
Well, what does this really look like if we sort of uh, go back to the depiction here? Well, if I declare a,、uh, an integer i, that gets defined in memory just as a little black box, call it i. So, same stuff as always. If I declare, by contrast, an array called a of size 5, well, that just gives us exactly what I described in memory a moment ago. Notice that they're using the bracket notation here. So, a bracket 0, a bracket 1, and that's consistent. With how we've used arrays in weeks past. But notice this line here. We can now introduce this syntactic trick of saying, you know what? For whatever reason, I now want to be able to manipulate this array. I want to give this array a nickname called P. So I and I know the array stores ints. So that means I now need a pointer to an int if I want to sort of create a synonym for A. So I declare int P. Gets A, and what that has the effect of doing in memory is giving us a little pointer depicted here as a circle and drawing an arrow from that circle to the first location in A. And so if I go ahead and do something like this, if I say、uh, print, I'm going to have to start, stop writing English so much because it,、uh, it just embarrasses me. But if I do something like this, print percent D, comma, Let's say a bracket zero. That's going to print which bits in memory? These guys right here. But what else could I do? Instead of writing a bracket zero, how could I, with a pointer, refer to that specific location in memory? Well, with star p. So p is somewhere in memory. You don't have control over where the pointers end up, but you do have control over what you store in the pointer. Because again, a pointer is just a little black box that's meant to store the address of something. Well, that address is apparently wherever a is, hence the yellow arrow there. And so star p in this case is synonymous with a bracket zero. And hence this tutorial's relabeling of that first cell with star p. And a bracket zero. So let's now move away from these little sandbox cases and pull up something more interesting. So compare1.c is an example of using pointers incorrectly. And it's kind of apropos since there was actually, I think, a bulletin board post or an email that went to help at cs50.net the other day that had precisely this bug. And it was fine because we hadn't even yet gotten to it. So this program here apparently has the user give a string. So we've got this first line here get string. Now, what data type did getString used to return as of last week? So it returns a, a string, right? Lowercase s t r i n g. Well, today we take that training wheel off. The CS50 library created that illusion of a string data type, doesn't exist. It's just kind of nice to assume that it exists. Henceforth, strings don't exist, char stars exist. And so what I've written here is char star s1 for string number one gets get string. And then similarly, have I done a couple lines later, get string put its return value in char star s2. Now, what does that really mean? So, if strings are arrays of characters, which that much we kind of revealed last time, well, what does that mean? Well, if the first word I type in is, for instance,、uh, foo, F O O, well, what does getString really return? Well, getString, as that function in the CS50's library, creates an array, and what's stored in those blocks? So, F O F O. O O. Why did I draw four? Yeah, so you need that null character to tell that's the end of the string. So get string is returning not so much the whole array, but for because that'd be kind of inefficient. Why should you return four characters when really you can just return the address of that whole thing, which is especially advantageous if the array is even bigger. So get string actually returns a pointer, a nameless pointer in this case, so that when I say char star S1. What that's doing in memory is creating a little box, a local variable in main, calling it S1, and it's point putting in it because of the equal sign exactly where the address where get string put that user string. So what that means is at this point in the story, what is stored in S1? It's the address of the string called S1, and what's stored in S2? Well, it's the address of The second string that the user provided. But let's push a little harder. What's stored in S1? It's the address of the first byte in the array that getString created. And S2 is the address of the first byte in the array that getString created there. So when, if the goal now is to check if the user typed the same word twice, why is this broken? 
So right, what are we comparing in the line there? If S1 equals equals S2, and that's what we said, this is how you test for equality, equals equals. Well, that's wrong because if the user typed in a string and called get string, it put it, say, up here in memory. If the user typed in another string and get string got that one, it put it elsewhere in memory. So what are you really comparing? The address of this array and the address of this array, and sort of by nature of having called get string twice, you're comparing two completely different memory addresses. Even if they happen to point to the same string, f o o backslash zero, they're still completely different in memory. And so if I try running this thing with make compare one, and then go ahead and run compare one, and type in foo and foo, no typos, I typed. Different things. So, by popular request, let's go ahead and take a two minute break so you can shuffle, wake up, finish your puzzles, and we'll resume in two minutes. All right. According to iTunes, break is over. So, my elevator pitch about pointers only goes so high. So, I too need the, the break so we can now start back here and build up the excitement over pointers again. So, the cliffhanger with、uh, which we left off was this one. So, S1 did not, in fact, equal S2. And this was bad because the goal of this program was to compare two strings. And strings, again, are just arrays. And arrays are really just referenced by way of a pointer, a pointer that just、uh, refers to the very first byte in memory. So, conceptually, if you want to compare two strings for equality, one of which is here, one of which is here, what do you conceptually need to do to test strings for equality? A little louder? Test each individual character. Right? Yeah. So, so you have some kind of loop, for loop, while loop, whatever, and you want to walk through both of the strings. The strings are just arrays, so start at the first location in each, S1 bracket 0, S2 bracket 0, and then just walk from left to right, checking every character for equality. And the very first time you find a character that's not the same, what do you do? Return false or say, no, they're not equal. But when do you stop iterating? When you hit what? When you hit the null character in both strings? So in either, like just the first, ideally. Because if you're waiting to sort of see two backslash zeros, but one string is like yay big and the other is yay big, well, you might keep traversing well beyond the length of the shorter array, the shorter string. And then we've seen that's generally bad. You induce those things called seg faults if you go too far. So this is broken. So compare1.c, completely broken, at least insofar as we're trying to compare the strings. It is perfectly correct if we're trying to compare the pointers, but that's not a terribly useful exercise. Exercise. So let's look at compare2.c. So this 2 has the same lines of code up top, whereby I'm simply getting a string called s1 up here and s2 down here. And now notice what I'm doing. Well, hmm, interesting. I have this use of null explicitly. Let's come back to that. So now it turns out that in the standard library, there's actually a function. Called stircomp. So, testament to this、uh, succinctness of C and Unix and Linux, stircomp, S T R C M P, string comparison. Well, I've never seen this before. How does this thing work? Well, man,、uh, stircomp. Let's take a look. All right, so this is the section three of the manual, according to this little header here. Looks like there's two versions of this thing, stir comp and stir n comp. It compares two strings. Well, let's look at what it takes. So now that we finally started talking about these asterisks, these declarations, these signatures of functions in the man pages should hopefully make a little more sense. So stir comp returns an int. All right, well, let's see what kind of int in a moment. But what does it take as its parameters? So a char star called s1 and a char star called s2. But it turns out there's this other keyword this function's using. I mean, take a guess as to what and why the keyword const is there for. So it means constant, right, as you might guess, not hard. But why is it perhaps useful for this function to proactively declare apparently its first parameter as constant and its second parameter as constant? Yeah, so it's kind of like this safety check or this assurance that, hey, you can pass me your two strings. I'm not going to do anything to them because I've declared my parameters as constant. In other words, now that we're no longer passing things by value, that is by copy, 
Because in the world of copies, who cares what the, the function being called does to it? It's not going to affect you in the slightest. As soon as you start passing pointers around, you start to open yourself up to problems, to bugs, to security issues, because now you're essentially handing over the keys to your program's memory. Here, go to this address and do with it what I hope you'll do, but with no guarantees. So by saying const here, putting the keyword before the data type of the parameter, you're just saying, you're promising, I'm not going to change these variables. They'll be declared const. And if this function, the author of it, accidentally starts to change like letters in S1 just for kicks or in S2, well, the compiler at that point will complain and saying, whoa, you declared this function as const parameters. You shouldn't be doing that. All right, so that explains the signature there. How does this thing actually work? Well, let's see. The stir comp function compares two strings s1 and s2 it returns an integer less than equal to or greater than zero if s1 is found respectively to be less than to match or to be greater than s2 so in other words when you compare two strings it's great if you can compare them for equality and if they're equal apparently this function returns what well, zero. But if you're actually trying to use stir comp to be a little more powerful, like sorting things, like names in a database or numbers in a phone book, so things where you actually care about lexicographic ordering or dictionary order, or in this case, just pure alphabetical ordering, you kind of want a little more feedback than just yes or no. You might want before equal to or after, less than, equal to, or greater than. So you, you can actually use this to order strings. So that might be useful because it turns out the return value for stir comp uh, return an integer less than, equal to, so it just restates what the description of the function does. So what is the implication? And incidentally, an insert to a frequently asked question to quit out of the man page, hit Q. <laughs> um, that's come up a couple times. Or control C is often your friend. So in this case here, Apparently, this line of code where I say if bang stir comp s1, s2, quote unquote, you type the same thing, should be printed. So, why does that work? Well, stir comp returns a positive number, a negative one, or zero. It returns zero if they're equal. So, what is, why am I using bang there? It just flips the truth value, right? So it's sort of a little, you know, leap trick. You could be explicit, and it's not bad to be explicit, especially early on. That's really the proper way to handle this function. But zero, it, there's only one zero in the world. And if you invert it with the bang, it's just going to make it a non-zero value. So doing something like this is just sort of a, you know, syntactic sugar. You can just condense it into something a little more succinct, a little shorter, so long as you're familiar with what the implication is. So that's fine. Else we're going to print you type different things. So is this correct? Does this seem to be correct vis-a-vis -vis the first version, compare one? Well, let's, let's try it. Proof by example, perhaps. So compare two. Say something. Foo. Say something. Foo. It's pretty good. It's not bad. Let's try something else. Uh, whoops. Let's try something else. Uh, Nothing. Okay. So I hit control D. So another trick you should get used to, especially when it comes to just prior to submission, when we say bang on your programs, try to make your own programs crash. And per the most recent problem set, what does it mean when you type in control D to a program? It means pass in this notion of end of file. Like it's like saying to the program, there's nothing here. So stop waiting for it. There's nothing here. So control C kills the program. Control D is like saying, I'm giving you nothing other than a backslash zero, the null character. So what does the, what's the implication here? Well, let's go back into compare two and let's just see if we can break this thing by getting rid of what apparently was a good idea when I wrote it. So I'm going to get rid of that if condition and just leave in the stuff we talked about. So let's rebuild that, make compare to. So compare to, let's say foo, foo, didn't seem to break it. Control D, control D, ooh. Interesting. So now by hitting control D, it's literally telling get string, I got nothing for you return immediately. So it turns out that get string, and we'll see this when we eventually look at the source code in CS50's library, what do you think get string returns if the user doesn't provide a string? user doesn't walk away, so to speak. He hits control D or prevent, uh, passes in the end of a file. That is nothing. What does get string probably return? So it returns null, this special signifying value that sort of signifies, depending on the context, the absence of a value or the absence of enough memory, as we'll see. So functions generally return something like a positive number, like main or negative number to signify an error, or zero. But when you start dealing with pointers, not primitives, but pointers to primitives or pointers to other things, you return null, not zero per se, but all caps null to signify 
you know, some interesting corner case, like there was no string to be gotten. So the reason I have this check here in the original version is a sanity check, because it turns out that back in the day when stir comp was implemented, much like Stirling, the people who implemented decided, you know what, it is a waste of our time to put an if condition in our implementation of stir compare to check for the user if the two strings are null. Right? You gotta be kind of a sloppy programmer if you accidentally ask me to compare two strings that don't exist. So why should we waste CPU cycles every time this function's called, which over the history of time is billions of times certainly by now, why should we waste CPU cycles every damn time this function's called if we can just uh, put the burden on the user to make sure he's not passing in bogus values. And so with a lot of these functions that involve pointers, it is entirely up to you to check if what you're providing is legitimate. So I check if S1 does not equal null and S2 does not equal null, then this function is safe to use. Similarly, should you do this kind of check before calling something like Sterling? A lot of the uh, standard library functions that take pointers as inputs, should you do these kinds of checks before calling? Okay, so questions on this comparison and pointers. And it is perfectly okay, frankly, if all this doesn't quite go down the first time, because it certainly didn't with me. All right, let's take a look at another example then. So pointers one. So pointers one apparently demonstrates something called pointer arithmetic. And this is where we can start getting even more fancy, more sophisticated. So if a pointer is just an address, well, that sort of suggests that we can do arithmetic on it. It's just a number, like the number one, address location one, address location two. Well, we've already been able to move around memory in an array. How do you get to the tenth location in an array if the array is called foo? What do you type? Well, foo bracket ten or eleven, depending on how we're, or, or nine, depending on how we're counting here, zero indexed or not. So those um, square brackets are another example of syntactic sugar. It's just a useful way for you to get at a convenient location without having to really worry about the low level details. But what is foo? Well, if foo is just an array that we've defined, and so foo is some array here, looks like this in memory. Well, foo we now know is really a pointer to that first chunk of memory. And in this case, it looks like foo was declared like something like this. Int star foo, or rather, whoops, let me cross that out. This was declared as int foo bracket, in this case, one, two, three, four. So int foo bracket four. But what really got created in memory was something that looks like this picture now. So this is a more accurate depiction of what's going on there. So if foo, though, is just an address, and this, again, for simplicity, is one, two, three, four. So I draw this arrow, but what's really inside the 32 bits represented or called foo? Looks like the number one. So I can say foo bracket uh, let's say uh, two. Um, I should let me. Okay. Rather than confuse things by using one indexing, we got to go back to zero indexing. So if this is foo and this is location zero, one, two, and three, and this is my pointer called foo, which is pointing there. Technically, right now contains the address zero, which I was trying to avoid only because zero is generally bad. If you try to go to address zero, it's off limits to users for good reasons that we'll eventually get to. So this is the picture, and this is how we got to this point in the story with int foo bracket four. Okay, so the question was, I can get at this location here, this guy here, whatever is in this location, as you know, by just saying foo bracket one semicolon. All right, and I can do something with that address on the left-hand side. But if foo is really just a pointer, well, can't I say go to whatever is at location in foo, but wait, I don't want to go to foo, which is right there on the left-hand side, location zero. If I want to go here, really I want to go to whatever's in foo plus one, and you know what? Once you've done that arithmetic, go there. So you can do some neat things with this syntax, because again, if foo's just an address, you can go to the next address in the array, parenthesize it so that you do the right order of operations, and then with the star notation, the dereference operator, go to this address, I can say go to foo plus one, which in this case is going to be the number one, based on the memory layout, and then give me that value. So this is an example of pointer arithmetic, and it lets us do things like this. So this is 
pointers1.c. It's a very short program, just has a main routine. The initial stuff here is just to get a string from the user. Notice I'm using char star s, so we've gotten rid of those training wheels again. But now notice, because I started finally reading the fine print in CS50's library, it turns out that get string can return null in weird cases. Like if the user types a ridiculously long string, copies like the works of Shakespeare onto their clipboard, and then hits control V to paste it into my program. Well, if I just don't have enough memory available, get string isn't going to return part of Shakespeare's text. It's going to return none of it based on how the staff implemented it. And it's going to signify that it got none of it because it couldn't fit by returning null, thereby signifying an error. So you can induce those cases, those sort of crazy corner cases by just providing unexpected inputs like that. Well, what are we going to do if though s actually points to a legitimate string? Well, I'm going to initialize a variable i to zero. I'm then going to go ahead and check the length of that string s. And that's a good optimization. So I'm not calling sterling again and again. Incidentally, can sterling crash here? Is it possible that I'll be passing in a non-existent string at that point in the code? No, because I already did my sanity check here, right? So remember, Sterling will choke if you pass it null, but I already checked up there. It's not null. So at this point, I just have a loop that's apparently going to iterate from left to right over the string that the user typed in, and it's going to print it character for character by doing this little trick. So S refers to the first location in the array, that is the byte of the first character in the string, plus I means an offset here, 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 go on, and star means go to that address, go to that next address, go to that next address. And so the end result of this with make pointers 1.c is to give us a program that very sort of underwhelmingly prints out the same string, but line by line, character by character. If though I had rolled back two weeks in time, what was the previous way we would have written the same program to just print each character line by line? S bracket I, right? That's it. Like so, granted, we haven't given you a new capability per se, but we've given you a new a way of expressing it that once we start to inter introduce more interesting data structures, as they're called, will this actually be useful? But there's an interesting thing, given that we're now talking about arithmetic. So incidentally, let me actually go back here, in pointers one, we seem to, let's do the following. Let me butcher this for, let's say, uh, no, that's OK. Let's leave that alone. Let's take a look at pointers 2. So pointers 2 apparently has this trick first. So this is what's called static initialization of an array. It's a useful trick if you know in advance what you want to put in your array. In this case, eh, I wanted to put 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I don't need to use get int. I know in advance. I don't need to even tell GCC how big this array is because eh, it can figure it out by how many commas there are there. So that is syntactically valid. But notice this trick. So in this next line, it's kind of interesting. Turns out you can figure out the size of an array. Even though I said last week you can't figure out the size of an array. So there's no built-in property. There's no function you can call like array length like there is string length because arrays can be any size. Strings by contrast have that special sentinel value at the end, the backslash zeros. Arrays in general, they can go on for as long as they want and the very last value could be the number 23. It doesn't have to be backslash zero. But it turns out that if you declare an array in a function and then in that same function use this size of operator, it will effectively tell you how big that array is in bytes which you can then use to figure out how many elements are in it. So this is really just introduced as a little trick here. So notice that I'm going to claim that the size of this array is percent %d, where that is the return value of this keyword, size of numbers. All right, well, let's see what that ends up being. And then apparently I'm doing size of each element is percent %d, well, size of numbers 0. Well, what's this all about? So let, let's run this for a second. So make pointers 2. Let's run pointers 2. It's interesting. So the size of the array is 20, the size of each element is 4, and then it prints out the numbers. Well, first of all, what's going on there? Why in the world is the size of this array 20? So it's bytes. Yes. So the array is, has five elements, each of which, though, is an int which is itself 4 bytes, 32 bits, so 4 times 5, 20. That now explains why, ah, okay, the size of the array is 20 bytes. So really I should have been more proper and less misleading and say bytes 
I can then remake the program, rerun it, and okay, size of the array is 20 bytes. How do I then figure out the size of each element? Well, you just can check the size of any of the elements. So this is just a little trick that you might see in code written by others. If you just take an arbitrary location like numbers bracket zero, this is just asking the, the uh, C, what is the size of the zeroth element? Well, it, what is it going to be? It's an int. So that's consistent with what you would expect. But now let's actually, those tricks aside, take a look at this. And I am actually slightly regretting having included this because this is perhaps a distraction. Uh, consider this a neat trick if you'd like to figure out how many elements are in the array. You can check the size of the whole array, divide it by the size of each individual element, and that gives you n effectively. In retrospect, this is a stupid d uh, distraction, so let's skip that for just a moment and focus on the pointer arithmetic. So in this last line of code, I have this for loop, which for now assume is iterating from i equals 0 to 5. So in fact, just to make this simpler, int i gets 0, i is less than 5, i plus plus. This is all I care about showing for now. Bye bye distraction. All right, so now it's very simple, but it illustrates a more interesting point. There's something interesting here, which was revealed by those lines I just deleted. So this thing does seem to work. Let me rerun it, and it prints 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But how big is an int? Four bytes. But how many am I adding every time this loop? increases. Just one. In fact, if I was really sort of knowing my hardware, what I really should be doing is something like this. It's 20 bytes long, and on each iteration I really want to do uh, i gets i plus 4, right? Because if I have an array of ints, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right, that looks something like this. 1, 2, one, two 3, uh, 4, 5. That has the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. If this is memory address 0, What's the next one? So it's really 4, the next one is 8, the next one is 12, and so on. So it would seem that if I want to do this pointer arithmetic trick, I can't just go incrementing by 1, i++, plus plus, because where is that going to put me? Well, in the context of that array, a moment, in the context of that array a moment ago, where is that going to put me? Well, if I'm just doing plus 1, and we said that each of these things is 0 and 4 and 8 and so on, it would seem that every time I increment, I'm going to go here first, then I'm actually going to go here, 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 the fifth element's here, and yet really what I care about is this and this and this and this. Well, the neat thing about pointer arithmetic is that it's not a bug, what I've written. So in the context of pointers, the compiler can figure out, you know what, what type of pointer is numbers? It's a pointer to what type of element? Yeah, so actually, even though it's an array, it's kind of synonymous with doing something like that conceptually, right? We've sort of said those are synonymous. So really, numbers is known to be a pointer to an int, to another int, to another int. So this pointer arithmetic is taken care of for you. You, the programmer, don't have to care about what the size of those primitives actually are. And so that's neat. And we'll actually revisit that in some future problem set. But to get there, we need another trick still. So thus far, what is the only way we've been able to allocate memory? And that is ask the operating system for memory. What do you do? You make a variable, right? Or you make an array. You do something like this. But where does that memory end up? On the stack, that's kind of bad because what happens if that function that needs the memory goes away? Well, so does that memory. Now, in problem set three, the game of 15, we tried to work around that because the game board, the, the three by three or the four by four board, what kind of variable did we suggest you use for that by way of the framework we gave you? A global. So a global variable is nice because it's not on the stack, apparently, and it exists and is accessible for all functions in your program. And generally, as you maybe have heard in section or me say, generally global variables are frowned upon only because they tend to reflect an um, uh, they more often than not suggest that the person doesn't really know what they're doing, and so to fix some problem, they just put their 
variables global to avoid these kinds of issues. But in the game of 15, it kind of makes sense because the whole purpose of that game is to manipulate that board. So why not give everyone access to it? So there are certainly compelling reasons. But if you need memory that you want to persist and you need it dynamically, in the case of writing a database, you don't know in advance how many characters a person's name is going to be. Right? It might be D-A-V-I-D or it might be something much longer than that. Well, if you need to store people's names in your program, what could you do for each? You could just have an array of size what? What's reasonable for a person's name? Five's probably too small, even though it fits mine. So maybe 10, 20, yeah, maybe 20, okay, 30. How about 64? Probably fine. You're really paranoid, 128, right? And so these are database questions, like how many bytes do you reserve for variables or for uh, cells in your, in your tables? Well, that's kind of annoying because if you're using 20 or 30 or 64 bytes to store names, for David, you're wasting a huge number of bytes. So it'd be kind of nice if you could, uh, on demand, ask the operating system, you know what, I need some more memory and I only need this much memory. And so C does give you this capability. So whereas the stack gives you memory that goes away the t moment a function finishes running, you have what's called the heap, which is the stuff not down here conceptually, but up here, which grows downward, not upward, like the stack, that you can put anything you want. You can just ask the operating system, give me some more memory, because I need to fit more things in my database. Give me more memory, because I need to get more strings from the user. Just give me more memory, but don't get rid of it until I explicitly free it. And you can do this by way of a function called malloc for memory allocation. And it turns out you've been doing this all along. So let me go back to, let's see, pointers 1.c and notice this. Never in your code, unless you've sort of been reading ahead or sort of figured this out on your own, have you written the command free. But it turns out that the CS50 library has what's called a memory leak. If you use CS50's library to make some commercial piece of software for whatever reason, and that person and the users, your customers, run that software all day long, all week long, eventually it will crash or slow to a crawl or just generally do bad things because there's a known bug, an intentional bug in CS50's library. And that bug is that get string uses memory from the heap. It asks the operating system for you, which in the first few weeks of the course is great because you don't even have to think about it. It asks for memory in order to fit those strings that you're getting from the user with get string. But have you ever, as the programmer using get string, given it back? Probably not, right? So you, in any of your programs, especially programs that loop, if you keep calling get string, get string, get string, you're getting chunk of memory, chunk of memory, chunk of memory from us but you're calling us, so it's now your memory, but you never give it up. And so this was very common years ago and still today with programs that similarly ask for memory, use it, but never give it back. So if you've had those programs that for whatever reason your computer starts to slow to a crawl or just things start freaking out and get very, very slow, could be there's some stupid infinite loop in there, but it could just be that you're using up more and more and more memory. And if you go to like your process manager, they'll say you're using two gigabytes of memory and all you're running is like AOL instant messenger. Well, that's just because programs that were running might have asked for more and more memory or something in the computer but never gave it back. So henceforth, just like we're taking away the synonym string and pushing it forward as char star, so are you also now expected to free your strings lest you create precisely the situations that have so annoyed you as users for years. Turns out it's very easy to give memory back. Free, the name of the pointer, close parenthesis. And that's it. And that gives that memory back to the computer. Now the only gotcha is doing this generally bad. Now you'd have to be pretty unwise to actually hard code this into your program, but null is clearly a value that can be stored in variables. So you also want to check you, when freeing memory that it actually is there, lest you pass in null. And what are you probably going to get if you pass in null? What seems to be the theme? Segmentation faults, generally very bad things. Well, let's see how we can now not only free memory, but explicitly ask for it ourselves by way of this example. So in copy1.c, the purpose in life here is to copy a string. Now, unfortunately, copying a string is not going to be as easy as doing something like this. Uh, char star s1 gets get string, and then char star s2 equals s1. Right, this should already kind of worry you because what are you really copying with that second line? 
just the pointer. So now you have two nicknames for that same chunk of memory. If we touch one chunk, we're really touching both of them. And we can see that with this horribly written program here. So this is copy1.c. Notice that at the very beginning, I ask the user for a string. I do a little sanity check. So that's actually an improvement over last week to make sure the user's not messing with me by hitting control D or trying to break my program. Now notice though I'm doing what I just said was a bad idea. I'm going to try but fail to copy the string because all I'm copying there is the pointer. It's a very fast copy because you're really just copying the address of the array, not all of the bytes. But notice now, the goal of this copy program is not only to copy it, but I'm first going to do this. Well, first, let's make sure that the length of this string, S2, is greater than zero because I'm not a complete idiot. I'm at least going to check that there's something there. But what am I going to do next? Well, I'm going to change the zeroth character of the string, the first one, to be the uppercase version of itself. So we can go back and do the fun little Caesar cipher and Visionaire cipher of the modular arithmetic, add something, mod 26. You don't need to. It turns out all this time there was a function called to upper where you don't need to actually do that kind of math yourself. Well, this is going to capitalize the first letter of the string and the goal of this program now is to print what the original string S1 was and what the new copy, the capitalized copy is S2 and then for good measure we free the original string because the original string again was allocated by get string. So the rule of thumb is going to be if you allocate some memory, you free that same memory if you yourself did it or by way of our library. So what's this thing going to do? Make copy one. All right, so copy one, enter, say something, foo. Hmm. So there's the bug, right? It capitalized both even though the point of this program was to copy it. Now fortunately it does work if you do that. So not a very good test. Let's take a look at copy two and improve upon this. So it looks like I'm still getting S1 from the user here. I'm doing a sanity check and checking if it's null, but here's the new trick. So if you want to make a copy of something, now the burden's on you, the, user, the programmer. You need to copy a string by being consistent with how it's implemented. So a string is an array of characters. So what does it mean to copy a string? It means to allocate another array that's of the same size and then yourself manually move every character from the first array into the second one and then capitalize the second one and not the first, presumably. So how do we do this? Well, I'm going to call the second string S2, although really you're calling the pointer to the string or really the pointer to the first character in the string or really the pointer to the first character in the array that is the string. This is all the same kind of things, but perhaps hearing it different ways sort of reinforces what's really going on. What am I going to do? Well, first I'm going to allocate some memory with this new function malloc. Well, how much memory? Well, I need the length of the string, S1, times the size of every element. Well, I know it's a char, so I'm going to do the length of S1 times the size of a char and then plus one. Why? First of all, what is this going to give us if I type in foo? Quick sanity check. Okay, three. Not that hard. It doesn't count the backslash zero. It's the conceptual length of the string. The size of char on this, on most computers? Just one, right? But this at least deals with issues if I port my code to some, tr like a phone, a cell phone, or some uh, microwave, any kind of embedded computer where maybe chars have a different number of bytes. It will still work because I've been dynamic in this way. So this is going to give me three bytes. Now, why this? plus one at the end when I'm allocating memory. You need the null character, right? It's not enough to do the first three. You need to terminate the string yourself. Now this is our sanity check. Any time you call malloc, you had better check the return value as to whether it equals null lest you then do bad things to memory you were not actually handed. Yeah. Oh, that's a good, um, yeah, that's a good point actually. So better here. Yeah, you're right. That's a bug. So uh, this really should have been written stir length of S1 plus one parentheses times size of char. I shall fix that. See what the bug is? So I made an assumption, right? I just preached that here that we're fixing bugs and really there's a bug there because I was still assuming that the null character itself takes up one byte which might not be realistic if some architecture, some CPU actually treats chars as bigger than just one byte. So good. I'll go back and fix that. So plus one of the length of the string. Okay. So now waving our hand at that little bug, copy the string. So first let's go ahead and, hmm, what did I do this for? Well, this is kind of stupid too actually. <laughs> 
Um, so I already checked if S2 equals null. Then I, well, maybe I'm a little OCD. Let's check that it's not null um, when really that's, I just wasted CPU. So I'm going to go and fix this whole thing tonight. How about? <laughs> um, let's assume I didn't do one of those checks. We'll skip one of them. Um, just double, all right. So in general, problem sets, yes, it's twice as protective, but it's not twice as good. Um, we only need one. So what are we going to do with this? Well, int n. So the str length of s1 we're going to store in n. That's pretty reasonable. I'm going to now iterate from i equals 0 to n. So that's pretty reasonable. Now I'm going to go back to my very familiar syntax, right? Pointer arithmetic kind of hurts my brain, especially the first time. So who cares? Let's just go back to the syntax that's familiar. We weren't gaining much by using pointer arithmetic. So the ith character in s2 should become the ith character in s1. And then I'm just going to go ahead and terminate it here. Though, you know, I didn't even need to do this manually. I could have just iterated from i equals 0 to what instead? Less than or equal to n. And then I could just copy the original null character anyway. So different ways. It sort of gets the same job done. Now I'm claiming dot, 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 capitalizing copy. I'm capitalizing the version in S2, which is kind of neat. And now I'm going to print out the original and the copy. So let's go ahead and make copy 2. All right, copy 2. I'm going to type in David. And oops, it worked. All right, not a real test. So how about foo, foo, and foo, in fact, worked. So now that we have this ability to allocate memory and we have this ability to free memory, will CS50's library start to make sense? Anytime you're allocating memory, again, conceptually, it's going to start ending up on this thing called the heap, which we'll start using even more. This next problem set that we'll release on Friday will not so much use pointers, at least not in depth, but next week's problem set, so a week plus, is going to be that forensics problem set where we're going to stroll around campus, take some photos, accidentally delete them, and challenge you with recovering them. And you're going to be making use of the file system using pointers to files on disk. So we'll talk about that next week. Otherwise, we will shall see you Monday. <laughs>